Okay, Phil Lee returning with another episode of Civil War Chat. Uh, today's program is going to be about uh, a critiquing an interview I saw by Professor Adam Domby, D-O-M-B-Y, regarding his new book, uh, The False Cause. It's about Confederate statues, and his conclusion is that they were erected almost entirely to celebrate and promote white supremacy. Uh, his, like, his, his interview was about a 70-minute interview with a group called the Avery Research Center of Charleston, South Carolina. Pres uh, Professor Dombey presently teaches at the uh, College of Charleston, and he's a Yale graduate undergrad and PhD from University of North Carolina. University of Virginia published this book. I did send him uh, an invitation to discuss the book uh, in his, you know, on this show and, 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 and the lecture that I watched him or the interview that I watched, he, he, he never responded. So I just decided I'll go ahead and cover this on my own. Before we do so, uh, the, the, the monuments and the so-called lost cause, the perspective that he sees coming from it uh, so is alleged to have come out of the reconstruction. So I want to give you some opportunity to learn uh, reconstruction from, uh, from a different perspective. My book, Southern Reconstruction, $22 at Amazon, $25 from me, signed. If you want it, uh, send me an email uh, signed, uh, Phil underscore Lee, L-E-I-G-H, at me.com. I will pay the postage if it's domestic. Southern Reconstruction, uh, $25 from Philip Lee. At Amazon, Barnes & Noble, other fine bookstores, $22. Also, U.S. Grant's failed presidency uh, covers the Reconstruction period, particularly focusing on U.S. Grant's role in that. He's uh, falsely credited with being a great civil rights president. Uh, this one is $20 at Amazon. From me, it'll be $23 signed. I will pay postage, same email address. So with uh, no further delay, let's go ahead and get started with my remarks on Adam, Professor Adam Dombey's false cause uh, interview with Avery Research Center of Charleston, South Carolina. You can find it on uh, YouTube. While watching a 70 minute interview with Professor Adam Dombey about his book, The False Cause, I was surprised at the number of errors, biased interpretations, and even endorsements of so-called extra-legal, meaning illegal, conduct by anti-statute activists. The false cause focuses on Civil War and Reconstruction memory, particularly involving Confederate memorials. First and foremost, Dombey erroneously proclaims that the signature Confederate statues erected in the, so in the Southern Courthouse squares between 1900 and 1920 were chiefly installed to celebrate white supremacy. In truth, they were erected because the old soldiers were fading away. The typical surviving Confederate veteran was aged 60 in 1900 and 80 in 1920. Moreover, memorials for federal and Confederate soldiers both surged during the war's semi-centennial, the 50th, 50th anniversary, from 1911 to 1915. Additionally, prior to the 1900, the postbellum South was too poor to fund many memorials. Even in 1900, the region's per capita income was only half of the national average. Finally, after the sons of the Confederate veterans eagerly joined the military to help win the Spanish, 1898 Spanish-American War, Union veterans realized that their former rivals were also Americans who deserved their own memorials. Second, Dombey wrongly singles out Southerners as racist without mentioning Northern racism. Consider, for example, the widespread obsession with defeating black heavyweight boxing champion Jack Johnson during this period. Johnson was the first black to hold the title, which he got in 1908. Since most white boxing fans were outraged that uh, a black had become a champion, promoters searched for a white boxer to beat Johnson. In 1910, they matched him against a previous champion, Jeff, Jim Jeffries, who had earlier retired undefeated. San Francisco novelist Jack uh, London, Call of the Wild, White Fang, had written, quote, Jim Jeffries must now emerge from his alfalfa farm and remove that golden smile from Jack Johnson's face. Jeff, it's up to you. The white man must be rescued, close quote. The bout attracted unprecedented attention, led from 
led by the New York Times, the mainstream press was hostile toward blacks. If the quote, this is from the New York Times, if the black man wins, thousands and thousands of his ignorant brothers will misinterpret his victory as justifying claims to much more than physical equality with their white neighbors, close quote. After Johnson won the fight, race riots erupted in New York, Washington, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, Omaha, Columbus, St. Louis, and Wilmington, Delaware. Now, I don't know whether any Biden ancestors were in that last one. It took boxing promoters another five years to find a white fighter, Jess Willard, to beat the aging Johnson in 1915. When his victory was displayed on a bulletin board updated by Telegraph in New York's financial district, Wall Street district, the roar from the streets, quote, would have done credit to a presidential victory, according to the New York Tribune. Quote, for a moment, the air was filled with hats and newspapers. Respectable businessmen pounded their unknown neighbors on the back and acted like gleeful uh, school children. Keep in mind, at this time in Wall Street, uh, the bankers were typically Ivy League graduates or from prominent, uh, certainly from prominent families. And this is the way they're acting. Third, Domney demeans the fighting quality of the Confederate soldier. He actually even laughs about it. Uh, he suggests that the Civil War would have lasted far longer than four years if the Southern fighters were any good. But in reality, he's merely repeating a common but flawed analysis taught by academics. I've heard this argument before. America's Revolutionary War, they argue, lasted eight years, which was twice as long as the Civil War. Yeah. But that remark overlooks the relative casualties. Soldier deaths during the Revolutionary War totaled 25,000, which was 1% of the population of the 13 colonies to become states. In contrast, at least 300,000 Confederate soldiers died during the Civil War, which was about 5% of the, of the white population. Assuming 400,000 Northerners soldiers died during the Civil War, their loss ratio would have been under 2%. Significant difference. But beyond that, the Confederate ratio was five times the rate. The loss ratio was five times that of the Revolutionary War in half the time. So on a time loss per unit time basis, it was 10 times larger. Such casualties were unsustainable. If America were to engage in a war today and endure the same proportional losses, the number of dead soldiers would total 17 million. Can you imagine what this country would do if we lost 17 million soldiers in four years? Can you, can you imagine that if we survived that, that uh, we wouldn't want to put up memorials to them? Fourth, to support his assertion that Confederate statues are, quote, all about, close quote, white supremacy, Dombey referred to businessman Julian Carr's speech at the 1913 Silent Sam statue dedication at North Carolina University in Chapel Hill. Carr notoriously boasted of whipping a black woman shortly after the war for insulting a white woman. He was 19 years old when that happened. In the telling of this story, Dombey makes a number of omissions and misrepresentations. First, his claim that Carr was the most prominent speaker is dubious. There were five others, including the governor of the state and the president of the university. None made racist remarks nor are there any such racist remarks engraved into the statue. Second, although the 19-year-old car's racist incident is indefensible, Dombey fails to explain that he was a major benefactor to blacks during his lifetime. No mention of this from Dombey. His was, uh, uh, cars was among the first Southern textile mills to employ blacks in production work as opposed to maintenance. His in-state donations to black education included the North Carolina College for Negroes, presently known as North Carolina Central University. The school's black founder praised Carr, quote, 
I have never known the first time for him to fail to give to any enterprise which he thought would benefit the colored people or to lend his influence in their behalf. I have known scores and scores of colored people who were the recipients of his kindness and generosity. I have never known a colored person too poor or ignorant who went to Carr for assistance who did not receive the same, close quote. Third, Carr also helped black educator William Gaston Pearson, who was born a slave in 1858 and worked as a youth at the Carr factory. Carr recognized his potential, potential and financed his education at Shaw University, where Pearson graduated in 1886 at age 28. Thereafter, Pearson began teaching in Durham. In 1922, he became principal of Durham's Hillside Park High School. In 1931, he was a, Hillside was accredited by the Southern Association of Secondary Schools and Colleges. It was accredited, and that was a major, it was academically accredited, and that was a major achievement for a black high school during the Great Depression. Pearson also made other major business, religious, and educational contributions to the Durham community. Fifth, Dombey excuses such present acts as monument destruction by mobs by explaining that any laws protecting Confederate monuments justify that opponents use what he calls, quote, extra legal, close quote, means to destroy them. Since extra legal is merely a euphemism for illegal, Dombey's argument, ironically, is no different from that of the original Ku Klux Klan. The Klan argued that their extra legal conduct was necessitated by the ironclad control of the voting apparatus of the carpetbag regimes. It doesn't matter who casts the ballots, what matters is who counts them. And in the carpetbag regimes, the uh, counting mechanism, the apparatus was controlled by the, uh, the government in place, which was the carpetbag, until they were taken out. Even though he condemned the KKK, South Carolina's last carpetbag governor, who was actually a reform-minded, his name, Daniel Chamberlain, he considered, it, he considered the, the, K, the KKK to be a predictable result, even though he condemned it. Here's what Chamberlain said. You can find this in an April 1901 article of an Atlantic Monthly. That's the same magazine where Ta-Nehisi Coates has been writing recently in, in the last 10 years. Quote, Chamberlain, quote, no excuse can be framed for its outrages. That's the KKK. But its causes were plain. It flourished where corruption had climbed into power and withered where the reverse was the case. What is certain is that a people of force, pride, and intelligence, when driven to choose between temporary violence and lawlessness and permanent misrule, will infallibly choose the former. In his farewell address to the Massachusetts le legislature in January 1861, Republican governor and abolitionist uh, Andrew warned that reconstruction should require no humiliation in the South and that it should ally with, quote, the natural leaders of the region, close quote. He prophetically explained that if such men were not taken in as friends, they would resume their leadership as enemies. Apparently, Dombey's heroes like Thaddeus Stevens, I'm assuming that's one of his heroes because Thaddeus Stevens and people like him shaped Republican Reconstruction for the primary purpose of creating a voting bloc to keep the Republicans in control in Washington. But Dombey's heroes like Thaddeus Stevens ignored Andrew's advice and, and, they, and it, exactly what happened. The natural leaders became the enemy. All that could have worked out if the Republican regimes in the South had tried to work cooperation between the races, but instead they taught the black man to distrust his former master and to vote against him. Anyway, Chamberlain ultimately concluded that radical construction was born of sinister motors, quote, sinister motors, 
cruelly exploited Southern blacks and was destined to die of its own inadequacies. In retrospect, he was, he was certain, quote, there was no possibility of securing good government in South Carolina through Republican influences. The vast preponderance of ignorance in that party, aside from downright dishonesty, made it impossible, close, black. close quote. The blacks, he felt, were egregiously abused. Quote, race was used as the tool of heartless partisan leaders, close quote. And he's speaking of the carpetbaggers there. Blacks were, quote, mercilessly exploited for the benefit of a political party, meaning the Republican Party, and heartlessly abandoned when the scheme had failed, close quote. Six, Dombey makes the common mistake of citing the declaration of causes for secession of the states, particularly those like Mississippi and South Carolina, as so-called proof that the Civil War was all about slavery. Yet he ignores the sectional differences that are revealed by comparing the constitutions of the Confederacy and the United States. Unlike the federal constitution, the Confederacies did not permit protective tariffs. Southerners were ahead of their time in recognizing the benefits of worldwide free trade. The South did not go to war over tariffs. The North went to war over tariffs. The North did not want a new country on its southern border with much lower tariffs than theirs because that would destroy the manufacturing monopolies north of the Mason-Dixon line. The Confederate Constitution also outlawed public work spending, which were instead to be financed by private industry or the states themselves. Since Southerners disliked crony capitalism, their Constitution prohibited subsidies for private industry which were allowed under the, quote, general welfare, close quote, clause of the federal constitution. The Confederate constitution only permitted spending for military defense, repayment of national debt, and the operating cost of the central government. No pork barrel spending. In order to discourage pork barrel spending further, the president was given the line item veto. And bills were normally introduced into Congress by the executive branch. He could, he could veto pork barrel projects out of a bill. In the United States today, you can't do that. The pork barrel either has to stay, it's called earmarks. It has to stay or the whole bill fails. The Confederate Constitution, you can get rid of the earmarks. The president could. Now, in the Confederate Confederacy, if the Congress originated a bill instead of the president, the Congress would need a two-thirds majority to pass it as opposed to a simple majority. Again, that was designed to minimize pork barrel spending. If Congress originated, okay, although her constitution authorized one, the Confederacy never formed a Supreme Court. As a creature of the federal government, they had observed that the U.S. Supreme Court tended to make rulings that increasingly concentrated power in the central government, which was contrary to the South's historical tradition of favoring states' rights. Seven. Even though Dombey remarks, quote, anytime you, in, in, this, in this interview, he remarks, quote, anytime you have someone trying to prevent a topic from being debated, it's a sign they are on the losing side, close quote. Even though he said that, he never responded to my request to be interviewed on this YouTube channel. And I'll extend that invitation again. Uh, Professor Dombey, I'll be happy to interview you. We can discuss our differences on the YouTube channel. If you want to call it a debate, that's fine. But, uh, you know, I just repeat the invitation. In sum, Dombey's interview by the Avery Research Center suggests that his research merely follows the predetermined conclusion of cloistered academics regarding the reasons for Confederate memorials. His purpose from the start was to find evidence that the statues were erected to celebrate and enforce white supremacy. At least that's the impression I get from his interview particularly up to 1920. But given the loss ratios noted earlier, only a cynic could reach such a conclusion. So I'll repeat for emphasis, the, um, if America were to fight a war today with the same loss ratio as the Confederates, our soldier deaths would total 17 million over a four year period. That would be 4 million per year, one 
million deaths every three months. Certainly, I think that anybody living today could imagine if we went into a war like that, there would be 30 years later, 40 years later, a powerful feeling that we should build memorials to them without demeaning anyone else, but just to honor what their sacrifice was. That's truly what the Confederate statues are about. Anyone but a cynic or an academic could understand that. All right, for Phil Lee, uh, November 5th, 2020, thank you for watching. Please note the notification bell up here in the upper right. If you click on that, you'll be notified every time I come out with a new YouTube video. Make comments below. If you uh, have them, I, I invite them. I am going to provide a link to uh, 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 an, an analysis, a speech I made specifically on Confederate monuments, which also addresses many points that, uh, that I think would counter Dombey's conclusion. So I'm gonna provide that down below. All right, for Phil Lee and Civil War Chat, um, I wanna thank you for watching and I'm gonna turn this thing off now. <laughs>